Hello, I'm, and welcome. I'm Dr. Elaine Saunders. I'm Deputy Chair of the Victorian PSC Committee, and it's my privilege this afternoon to be the first to welcome you. For those of you who tuned in early, we hope you enjoyed that fabulous video. Wasn't it fabulous? On Australian innovation. And that was put together by the remarkable Dr. Carl Von Moller. If you missed it, we'll share it again in, um, at the end and the link will be shared in the chat right now for you. You can look at it then at your leisure. I'm certainly going to. The PSC Foundation first acknowledges the Boomerang and Wurrung Wurundjeri peoples of the Kulin Nation, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation and of all the traditional custodians who belong to the lands where the PSC Foundation and all of you, our guests, are based. The PSC Foundation is really happy to acknowledge the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders who are with us today and their elders past, present and emerging, whose stories, traditions and living cultures in this country are a valuable resource, as are those of all who have come to make Australia our home. Together, we're Australian. My pleasure now to introduce uh, Mr Wayne Fitzsimmons, who's chairman of the PSC Foundation. Over to you, Wayne. Thanks, Elaine, and uh, welcome everybody to our 2020 PSC oration and the presentation of the Victorian PSC Entrepreneur Award. What very unusual and challenging times we find ourselves in. This time last year, we were gathering for dinner in Melbourne, and here we are, many of us still in lockdown and very much looking forward to reconnecting and coming together at events like these in person once again. So for that, I've worn the same clothes that I wore 12 months ago to our PSE event because I'm out of touch with the reality. Here's hoping that it's not too far down the track. However, for now, on behalf of the PSE Foundation, I thank you for all embracing today's online world and joining us. I'd like to make a special welcome to Jordan Green, the Chairman of the Victorian State Committee for the PSE Foundation, who has been instrumental in helping to put together this afternoon's proceedings to Victorian Chair Elaine Saunders and my trusty National Deputy Kelly Hutchinson. I want to thank all of the innovators and entrepreneurs who join us today for your courage and vision, the investors who are prepared to take a risk, the researchers, lawyers and others who are helping us weave our way into the new and uncertain economy without holding us back. I want to welcome and encourage policymakers to embrace progress and to think well ahead. I want to welcome anyone whose name or discipline I haven't mentioned. Last of all, I want to acknowledge and celebrate the extraordinary work and legacy, legacy of our namesake and computing pioneer, Trevor Piercy. It's a great honor to be introducing this, this afternoon's event during the fifth year of Victoria's Digital Innovation Festival, a festival which aims to help grow Victoria's digital economy, to create jobs and to fast track industry growth. The PSC Foundation is proud to have been a significant partner in the festival since its inception. This festival is about contributing, collaborating and connecting and celebrating. Sadly, we can't do this in person this afternoon, but this is most definitely the next best thing. In fact, at lunchtime today, we had Minister Pearson, the Minister for uh, State Services um, and Better Regulation, join our seminar, which, which ran on uh, resilience and uh, how we can cope in the uh, digital economy, the uh, post-COVID economy. I'd also like to pass special thanks to Cathy Coulters for both her personal support and the support of the Victorian government to help make this event possible. We will soon find out who's been awarded the 2020 Victorian PSE Entrepreneur Award, and we will then have the pleasure of hearing the oration, exploring the very pertinent topic of resilience specifically. How do we address our resilience and preparedness in this age of mistrust. As ever, we hope you find the oration stimulating and challenging. The subject matter is currently prominent for sure, and we hope the 2020 PSE oration stimulates even more debate. Now it is my great pleasure to ask our Victorian Deputy Chair, Dr. Elaine Saunders, Fellow of the Academy of Technological Science, to announce and present the 2020 PSE Entrepreneur of the Year Award. Dr. Saunders was our 2011 Victorian PSC Award, just the other day, for her entrepreneurial efforts, both in business and science. Her contribution to developing our ICT industry continues to this day. 
Elaine has a 30 year history in management of research and tech and in commercialization and international technology licensing. She has worked in public health systems, university research and teaching environments, technology commercialization, and of course in industry. Dr. Saunders is a widely recognized pioneer, expert, and entrepreneur in technology for the hearing impaired. She co-founded several successful high-tech companies and was associated with, amongst other distinguished roles, Cochlear's breakthroughs in its earlier days. Recently, she successfully exited her own hearing company, Blaming and Saunders, which specializes in helping people regain normal hearing. I can think of no better person to introduce our 2020 Victorian PSC Entrepreneur of the Year, Dr. Elaine Saunders. Over to you, Elaine. Thank you so much, Wayne. And if you're wearing the same suit as last year, I'm not wearing the same suit as last year, but I am wearing a dress, which is probably a bit uh, um, silly under the circumstances that seemed appropriate. Um, in addition to the special guests that were noted by Wayne, um, I'd like to acknowledge a few other people who are attending this afternoon. I'd particularly like to welcome uh, Simon Foster, who's Chairman of PSE New South Wales and National Treasurer of PSE. Brand Hoff, AM, 2011 recipient of the PSE Medal and Chairman of PSE ACT. Dr Anne Moffat, PSE Hall of Fame in 2011. The Honorary Kate Lundy retired, the Piercy Hall of Fame 2017, and the Honorary Fran Bailey retired, and all other friends of Piercy who are with us today. Thanks to you and to everyone online this afternoon for coming to join us on this special event and for your general support of the Piercy Foundation. The Piercy Foundation was started 22 years ago to celebrate support and encourage Australians to engage in and excel at the invention, development and use of information, communication and communication technology, computing technologies, for the betterment of our society. It's inspired by Trevor Piercy, who we saw in the uh, video, who is a global pioneer of the digital computing era. The foundation focuses on the people and dialogue that drive the ICT sector to stay at the leading edge. Trevor led the design and construction of the first digital computer in Australia, CIRAC, again, you saw earlier, making Australia the third country in the world to create such a computer. The PSC Awards recognise those who continue to put Australia at the forefront of technology development and application. Peer selection is the hallmark of the PSC Awards to recognise those individuals who've made a significant contribution to the development and growth of the ICT sector in Australia. Each year, the Foundation awards the PSC Medal for Lifetime Achievement. The medalist and up to two others are inducted into the PSC Hall of Fame to recognise their very significant lifetime contributions to Australian ICT. Those awards, together with the National PSC Entrepreneur Award, were made later this year in Sydney. Today, we're celebrating 22 years of the Victorian PSC Entrepreneur Award, which recognises an individual or team who's taken a risk, made a difference, and is an inspiration to the Australian ICT community. It's judged by a committee of past award recipients. This is the community recognising the significant achievements of its peers who are in the midst of their career and are leading the Australian ICT sector from the front edge of the global stage. This year, the Victorian PSC Entrepreneur Award goes to a man who has become one of the world's leading innovators of creative technologies. He grew up in a Victorian country town where creativity was thought to have very little value and where an interest in, in computers was considered weird. His love of software programming and computers transformed him transport him out of that country town and onto the global stage. His passion for technology and the empowerment of creativity transformed his life and the lives of the 1,200 people who now work for him. The person we're honouring today took it upon himself to change the world. From the experience he encountered into something entirely new, different and better. He's been at the global forefront of video technologies 
well over 30 years as a designer, engineer, technologist, businessman, and creative artisan. He's built an international company that's leading digital cin cinema camera development, live streaming, broadcasting, editing, special effects, and sound engineering. His products are used by millions, and the explosion of high quality film and videos on Netflix through to YouTube owes a great debt to his vision and passion. Based right here in Port Melbourne, this company has operations in the USA, Europe, the UK, Japan, Hong Kong, Singapore, and Indonesia. In the last 20 years, he's built a very large company which now represents a high watermark in the Australian technology sector. His vision for this company has made it one of the best advanced technology businesses anywhere in the world. An advanced manufacturing company, including software, apps, operating systems, and hardware development, all under the same roof, with some of the smartest engineers in the world. In his industry, he's become a legend for single-handedly democratizing video for everything, everyone. Whether you're a 15-year-old listening to edit the first time, or a Hollywood director of the photography shooting Avengers, your go-to products and workflows all come from this Melbourne company. Along the way, he wasn't afraid to take risks. In 2009, an iconic brand of the video productive, production industry globally, based in the USA, was failing. That company couldn't deliver what the market needed, despite already being a globally dominant supplier in the niche. So this Melbourne-based company stepped up, acquired the technology assets, and the engineering team of that American company re-engineered the technology, redesigned the user experience. It's a tectonic shift in the capability and accessibility of the technology in the worldwide video community. He's been forthright and outspoken in his engagement with the industry and with government and with the broader community to voice his perspective and make a difference to how our community views both its opportunities and its pathways to get to international success. Always able to rely on the examples of his achievements and the trail he's blazed to validate and substantiate his calls to action. Ladies and gentlemen, without any further ado, the 2020 Victorian Piercy Entrepreneur of the Year is Grant Petty, founder and CEO of Blackmagic Design. The award recognizes outstanding individuals for who they are and how they have lived their lives. To make a difference to others, Grant epitomizes the value of the PSC Award. Grant, on behalf Hi, of the PSC Foundation, on behalf of your peers among our prior recipients of this award, and on behalf of everyone who's with us this afternoon, huge heartfelt congratulations. Can you then please share with you some of your thoughts? Thank you very much. I'm actually using one of my products right now. <laughs> I have to use it um, to connect. I do it with every stream that we do now, but uh, no, thank you very much. It's very humbling um, to be, I mean, I guess what's interesting and I guess, you know, every, most, you know, almost everyone here is from Australia and they would probably understand how difficult it can be here. It's a very property-based economy um, so it's difficult, you know, we're commercializing ideas or dreams and you can't measure them. And so the, I think the difficulty that we all have is that there's no really bad people. There's no bad person you can point to that causes problems with us innovating here. It's just that you can't measure what doesn't exist. And so, you know, I think this is a surprise and really humbling because it's an amazing group of people and to get an award is sort of one of the first times anyone's said, that we're doing the right thing. So it's not an easy place. So thank you. Um, but what's really good is that the young people we talk to, we've been doing a few of these innovation festivals and trying to get the word out to the business world and even the media that we don't have to just copy ideas from overseas. We don't have to be like, you know, you can lose yourself in the next problem and the next problem can be the innovation. And there's, you know, we've got to take our place in the world and the ideas can come from here. They can come from anywhere, you know, come, come from a village in Indonesia. We're a connected world now. I don't see why we have to rely on America. 
to always innovate and we just quickly follow. There's no reasons why people here can't innovate if you immerse yourself in the problems. So I think it's a really humbling moment and thank you very much. I really appreciate it of it. Um, it's a shock because it's been such a difficult road. And I think that's the funny thing. The smarter people are, the more they rely on metrics and numbers and formulas and calculations. And it's funny that the PC Foundation was based on Australia's first computer, but that computer was designed to manage and process data. And it turns out data is actually the biggest, what would you call it, a threat to innovation because you don't have any data on something that doesn't exist. So it's a wonderful uh, moment. Thank you very much. I uh, really appreciate it. And uh, it's uh, just, I mean, I'm a bit speechless, which is unusual for me because I do love talking, which is what you spend most of your time doing when you're working with groups of people. But thank you very much. I'm really uh, shocked and very appreciative. Thank you very much. Thank you, Grant. That was very humble from a, a great achiever. Um, so congratulations again. It's now my thank pleasure you. to introduce Chairman of the PSC Foundation Victorian Committee, Jordan Green. And he's going to introduce today's PSC orator. Jordan, welcome. Over to you. Thank you, Elaine. And once again, congratulations, Grant. You're a great exemplar of the passion and success that we need and have in the technology community in Victoria. I think your experience with global technology and supply distribution chains will be re very relevant to what comes next. Ladies and gentlemen, that now brings us to the 2020 PSE oration. Each year, the PSE oration is presented by an eminent expert reflecting on critical contemporary issues impacting our nation arising from the introduction and adoption of new and advanced technologies into our society. The coronavirus pandemic has exposed a global lack of resilience as a result of the collective failure to assess and act on national risks and vulnerabilities in the face of a rapidly changing world. Whilst Australia's response to the pandemic has been comparatively very good, our national preparedness and thus resilience has been found wanting. We had left our resilience and therefore our sovereignty and security to the largely foreign owned market, particularly with regard to technology systems and solutions. Today, we are thrilled to have Mr. John Blackburn deliver the 2020 oration. Prior to his retirement from the Australian Defence Force, John was Deputy Chief of the Australian Air Force and has been an F-18 fighter pilot and a test pilot. John has held a series of other senior roles, including commanding a multinational defence headquarters, being head of strategic policy in the Australian Defence Headquarters, and quite some time deep in our cyber defence community. After leaving the Air Force, John has worked as a consultant to industry and government, guiding, advising and publishing in the fields of defence and national security, with a particular focus on resilience. Today, John is a Fellow of the Royal Society of New South Wales and the founding chairman of the Institute for Integrated Economic Research in Australia, where he leads pioneering work to better prepare Australia to survive and thrive in an uncertain future. He was previously chair of the Institute for Regional Security, deputy chair of the Sir Richard Williams Foundation and on the Australian Strategic Policy Institute Council. Last year, he was a member of the advisory panel to the chief scientist on hydrogen strategy. And if you're not exhausted yet, he also advises a number of high potential startup ventures. Today, John will provide his perspective on how we address our resilience and preparedness in this age of mistrust. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming Air Vice Marshal John Blackburn AO. John, we're in your hands. Thank you, Jordan. Thank you to you and the PSC Foundation for the invitation to deliver the oration today. I really am honoured to do so. So the challenge I've got is to think about how we address our resilience and preparedness in what we're calling an age of mistrust. I'll go a bit more into that afterwards. Uh, at a great risk, I'm going to give you a one sentence answer to that. Hopefully, during my presentation, I might justify what I say. I think the answer to this is sentience because reason is not enough. If reason and logic were sufficient to justify or to motivate us as a society to address our risk and vulnerabilities, 
then we'd be in a much better position today than we are. But it's not. More of that a little bit later. So to set the scene, I'm coming from not only 43 years in defence, but the last 10 years with industry, but looking through the lens of the Institute for Integrated Economic Research that I chair. So what I think's happened is that coronavirus pandemics exposed this global lack of resilience. And I think it's because of a collective lack of uh, failure of preparedness. So the pandemic's not the only issue here, is it? It's taken off the wrapping of our society. And now you can see a lot of the vulnerabilities, the fragility in large parts of our societies globally. And there's the issue that we have to address. When I talk about resilience, <clears throat> I look at that as a characteristic. It's very important, but it's that characteristic attributes of individuals or collectively as a society that allows us to respond and deal with the challenges that we face to either return to a previous state or in the case we are now to adapt and transform our societies to deal with those risks. But largely from my military experience, I don't think you can be resilient unless we're prepared. Because if you are prepared, you've looked at the risks, you've rehearsed what you're going to do, you're far better able to react to the time. Now, I think we've reacted very well to the pandemic, certainly compared to a lot of other countries in the world, but were we adequately prepared for this? Or, in fact, for a range of other risks that we'll be facing in the forthcoming decades. We've left our resilience and therefore our sovereignty to a largely foreign owned market because effectively we have not done much integrated system risk analysis in this country. We tend to deal with things in stovepipes. We're an island nation. We're at the end of very long global trade routes. We're heavily reliant on just in time supply chains with very limited resilience in those chains and low tolerance for loss and disruption. And you can see, for example, what's happened with supply chains globally as large parts of the global economy shut down. And particularly in the medical or PPE area, we saw countries fighting for the limited supplies that were available. So I think one of the big lessons we're gonna to have to take out of the pandemic, the lowest cost, which is what we've been driving as a priority in our society for the last couple of decades, comes at a very high price in a crisis. So the question is, what do we do about it? So the Institute I chair, partnered with Global Access Partners in Sydney, another institute and a range of other bodies, has been running a national resilience project. So to try and look at this, we've tried to address the components of our society or examples of them and try to understand how they fit together. Now, of course, this is not all of the components, in the ICT area, we've been looking at information and data in particular. And what we're trying to do in each of these areas is three things. Firstly, where are we today? How do we get here? And most importantly, what assumptions have we been made in a particular domain? That's important to understand the assumptions and the risks that come with them. Secondly, what are the issues that we need to address beyond the pandemic? What are the risks and vulnerabilities that we need to take into account? Thirdly, what we should do about it? not just react to the pandemic, but what should we be preparing, preparing for for the next couple of decades? Now, this is an idealistic picture. We've also asked people to think about how does their area that they're looking at connect with the others. We've had about 150 people uh, all volunteer to be involved with this from all range of industries and, and uh, government areas across this country. We'll end up having with close to 400. But when we've looked at this, unfortunately, this picture of it, the jigsaw is a complete fantasy. <laughs> Without overplaying it, when we've looked at each of these areas, fundamental disconnects because of a lack of coherent strategies or policies that link them together. In the education and research one, the vast majority of, of the amazing research being done there is not connected with an industry policy. And as a result, a lot of that research effectively gets exported. At the risk of being a little bit flippant, this is what the world's been looking like to us as we look at each of these pieces and ask, hang on, how are they connected in the absence of that integrating policy environment? And the challenge, of course, if you think of this as a jigsaw, we don't have a photo of the completed puzzle. A bit of a challenge. So the three questions we're trying to address in this project are what is a resilient society? Are we resilient enough? And can we make ourselves more resilient? So as we've been going along with the resilient society, we think there are three fundamental issues. Now the workshops have a lot of detail, which we bring out of them, but at a at a systems level, you can't be resilient if you're not aware. That shared knowledge 
across society of a situation where we're in, both current and emerging. We've heard people talk about data before. We need to understand what's actually happening and most importantly, take that information and do a comprehensive risk analysis and recognize assumptions. That's the starting point. You can't address a problem if you don't understand it to the best of your ability. Second, if we're going to do something, then we've got to be able and willing to work as a team. Now we saw at the start of the pandemic response with the formation of the National Cabinet and that teaming between state, federal government, industry and unions was working pretty well. It's fragmenting very quickly right now, sadly, but you could see in the early stages that was so important. Those first two principles are a reality what Defence Forces do, the ADF does. Shared situation awareness, and then the ability in, to operate as an integrated team. Those are the two fundamental areas. But defense organizations really put a lot of effort into the third aspect, which I think is applicable to our society. And that is to be prepared. If you look at the military model, this model of readiness, what components of your organization, your society have to have a certain levels of readiness and how long can you sustain them for in the midst of a crisis. But to do that, there's extensive risk analysis, planning, training, a lot of simulation, war games. So what happens in a military sense, people get to experience how to work as a team in a crisis well before anything happens. And no, you can't predict the future and people will make excuses. you can't prepare for unknowns. But if you've learned to work as a team in a crisis, if you've learned to work out how to manage that and, and coordinate things, you are far better prepared for anything you face. One of the issues of being prepared that we've been proposing to government in a number of submissions to joint parliamentary committees and in our interaction with politicians is these two themes of smart sovereignty and trusted supply chains. And this trusted supply chains addresses one of our fundamental problem with our supply chains. This is an age of mistrust. Who can you trust? A bit more of that afterwards. For the ICT sector, the implications that I want to highlight here is none of this is possible the shared awareness, the teaming, the measuring preparedness developed without the capabilities that your industry sector produces and delivers. It's not possible. How well can we do that today is the important question. Are we resilient enough? Well, I've mentioned our pandemic experience. Uh, and despite the cracks starting to appear, my main concern now is we don't really understand very well the vulnerabilities that not only come from the experience now, but those pre-existing in our society. The lack of preparedness is some really simple examples. I'll just show a couple of them. If we look at our import dependence, 90% of our fuels, 90% of our medicines, nearly all of our PPE, and more than 99% of all the shipping that does 98% of our exports and imports um, is all foreign owned. We import billions of dollars worth of fertilizers. When you look at these areas, have we done a risk analysis of what this degree of import dependence means for us and how we could address some of those vulnerabilities, for example, with stock holding in certain areas? That's not the total solution, but we don't mandate any stock levels to be held for fuels or medicines or just about any other area. It's all been left hands off to the market. That's not really a very clever way to deal with things, particularly when, for example, in the pandemic, the demand for medicines and PPE explodes. And we have one small company, I think in Shepparton, able to produce a very small amount of masks at the whole start of this process. Interesting listening to the CSIRO CEO about two or three weeks ago at the National Press Club, he talked about this 30 years of economic growth had lulled us into a false sense of security. He noted that business R&D investment has been declining and effectively, some of our R&D RD is now being treated like we with iron ore and coal, dig it up and export it. Then we're not applying that innovation and thinking here into industry and capability on the ground. Certainly not enough. There's a lot there, but we don't have a coherent policy of how to utilize that to build capability in this country. In the ICT sector, What's coming out of our workshops, of course, is the critical dependence on imported technology, infrastructure, and software. Our dependence, for example, is on the US, the sustainment of the web and all the satellite services that are going on. We're asking the question in this sort of area, what sovereign capability should we have? What do we need in this country in our range of areas I'll talk about in a moment that allows us to function normally and to continue functioning in a crisis? So these two things we've been talking as an example to government is that we need to think about smart sovereignty. 
in a crisis, what do we need in terms of Australian-based manufacturing, ICT capability, domestic supply chains, R&D, facilities, skills, and most importantly, an experienced workforce? What parts do we need to have Australian ownership or control over? I think a good example there was the decision on Huawei with 5G. But we've got to define what's important to us and then be prepared to pay the cost premium to have it. It might cost a little more, but the resulting price in a crisis is much lower. But we are part of a global trade system that will continue. And so for critical areas where we are dependent on imports, we try to raise this issue of trusted supply chains. They need to buy diverse, they need to be transparent, and we have to be able to verify them. The government admitted in an interim report last year on fuel security that we don't have a model or a, a, a good understanding of our fuel supply chain. The work my institute's been doing on medicines, for example, medicine supplies, we don't have a model for that either. So how in heaven's name can we get transparent and verifiable supply chains when we don't even understand what those supply chains actually are like? The United States, for example, last year in a Congress uh, commission identified that, that its dependence for medicines and critical ingredients upon China was what they described a national security risk. The country from which we get most of our actual manufactured medicines is the United States. Any risk they have becomes a risk of ours. So let's take those things aside for a moment and say, how did we get here? And one of the things that we want to highlight is effectively, in our view, we have industrial age government and business models. We have departments for this and ministers for this. There's nowhere that brings together that integrated system level view of how our society functions and how all those components fit together. I had naively thought that that would be done in PMC, but after producing a paper on economic security, I was contacted by PMC and they said, look, we'd love to address these issues, but we're not structured to do so. That's a major problem. This free market fixation is another significant one. If we don't think logically about what capabilities we need and must support inside this country for resilience, then we have effectively sold out our sovereignty and our independence to a foreign owned market. The culture of complacency leads to a lack of preparedness, and that is a bit of an Australian problem. And finally, if I look at our political system, there was a very interesting Treasury paper that in 2018 that said, if you look at what Hawke Keating and the Howard governments did, there were some brave decisions on economic policy which built economic resilience, allowed us to deal with the GFC. I'd say in the last 10 years though, the fixation of near-term politics, the lobbying pressures, frankly, a fixation of party over nation, has led to a completely different political environment that it is not applying priority to look at our risks and vulnerabilities and looking at how we need to change in the face of a changing world. So when I start talking about the emerging risks, so don't let's look at today, what we're trying to consider are these sort of areas, everything from health all the way through environment, economy, conflict, technology, and the one that really concerns us is social cohesion. With growing inequality, with both health and impending major economic problems for the next decade or so, that's, I think, a major society risk. We can see from examples of basically society crumbling with what we're seeing in the United States and in part of Europe. Uh, we need to address this if we're going to be resilient. The challenge in doing this is that you need to think at a systems level, which is not currently done at government. We can't just look at the likely scenarios. When the Office of Na National Intelligence said about a year ago, I think it was, they provide analysis on likely scenarios or probable ones to government. We need to do a few worst cases because 12 months ago, if you were talking about pandemics and we were in briefings in our institute, you're basically disregarded. No, that's not likely. The other challenge of course is concurrency. When we look at this, this next summer with the likelihood of both bushfires and a pandemic, we'll start to experience what the Americans are experiencing now. The other issue we get concerned about is a growing gap between the need or threat and the capability. Back in 2011, Dr. Gary Waters and I produced this report with the Kokoda Foundation looking at our cyber challenge. Now, both Gary and I had a fair bit of experience in cyber defense, uh, cyber policy and defense at one stage was under my area. So when we left full-time service in the military, we did this study to try and look at the broader civilian infrastructure. 
we were very worried about what we saw because the way we'd assumed the outside world was working was based upon how we were addressing these issues inside defense. One of the big problems we were concerned about was this, that when we looked at the exponential growth of the threat, whilst we were improving as a nation and growing up here our capability, the gap between threat and capability looked to be growing. Nine years later, I don't think that's actually got any better, to be honest. If we remember back to the Saudi Arabia uh, case last year where their refineries were attacked, this is the statement from the Pentagon Under Secretary of Defense just after the attack. The threat we face has developed faster than our countermeasures. As much progress as we made, if you're not staying equal to or making greater progress than the threat picture, it's a serious problem. My concern about this also came from my flying career. So back in the 1970s, I was flying the Mirage and the photograph here on the left looks like from a museum because that's where they are at the moment. Uh, as a 22 year old, this was an exciting job, but the information and capabilities on it were very basic. The technology was basic. Uh, no inertial navigation system, certainly no GPS, no moving map. Up here on the side, was a, on the top right was this instrument called a position heading indicator. Um, we used to call it the pure horseshoe indicator because that's all we ever got out of it. Uh, when we were flying these aeroplanes at a thousand foot above the ground of the Malaysian jungles at night at about 900 kilometers an hour, we'd have a, a paper map that we'd put on a roller and you'd manually roll this thing and try and put the map and compare it to the ground radar to see where you were. It was exciting. 10 years after I was flying this, I'm now flying that CF-18. The technology leap was fundamental. However, in the early decade of these aircraft, when we got them, the integration of that information still happened in your brain. The systems weren't integrated. We couldn't get the information off the platform because the first data link we had linked for was a single track only. So the way we got information off that was on the radio, calling a target where it was relative to us. So despite that technology leap, the ability to get the information off or to share it was fundamentally limited. Let's step forward another 30 years to the Joint Strike Fighter. I'm too old <clears throat> to have flown this, but I've been in the sim. They've addressed it a lot of those integration issues on the cockpit and between other JSFs. It's amazing that you're doing sensor level data integration and fusion, not just tracks. But can you get that complete sensor picture off that platform in real time to everybody that needs it or to people on the ground in the middle of a fight? No. One of the problems all that I've seen with all this stuff is the technology has been improving at a pace, but the architecture sitting on top of that, that enables us to share or do something with it has been in lag. So <clears throat> if I come back to this concern on the cyber area and think about ICT, is our ICT integration capability developing at a slower pace than the level of complexity and the number of systems we're dealing with in our society. Because if it is, how do we get situational awareness of this incredibly confused picture that's going on out there? And one of the things that Ian McDonald and I, and we, we co-author a number of articles on this, we talk about the need for a national ICT architecture or model that almost like an iOS backbone that the apps can come and sit on. Because even in the last summer's bushfires, trying to get an integrated picture was next to impossible until two ICT innovators produced bushfire.io. We need to do better than that. They did a fantastic job, but as a country, we've got a problem. Again, technology, I think, is impeded by a lack of architecture. So when we come back to this picture here, that's the problem we've got. We look at these components as our society. We don't have a clear picture and we don't have an architecture for this. So we're still working in components. So can we make ourselves more resilient? It's the same three areas. The first place you have to start with awareness. We have to do that comprehensive risk analysis. It's gonna to have to be done independently. Governments are not in a position to really lay out that range of risks because if they do, they then get asked, why haven't you fixed it? Well, that's the reality of the world. But the challenge here is that this has to be not just government information, but from business and community and trusted sources, a bit of a challenge nowadays. The second thing that we have to be able to do is to work out how we team. There's all those issues, but it's not, again, just about government. It's business and community. Um, the way the interaction currently between the public and the government is a challenge, particularly in relates to trust in that area. 
but most importantly, prepared. We're talking about these things about you have to design resilience. It's not just the sum of the piece parts. We need to support community and business initiatives far more than we currently do to build a capacity in this country. And government action is required. One of the things that we're saying, not only this smart sovereignty and trusted supply chain examples, we need to think about stimulus in this post COVID environment beyond shovel ready roads and infrastructure. We need to have stimulus investment where it's going to be in areas in our society that improve our resilience. And effectively, we need a national resilience strategy plan and implementation, and we need to do it in partnership. We're already having a lot of discussion with New Zealand on how we could look at this resilience, not only for Australia, but with New Zealand and Pacific Islands as a system. Bit hard to have a national resilience strategy when you probably don't realize this, but we do not have a national security strategy either today in a world faced with incredible complexity. In the ICT sector, we're not gonna be aware without the technologies that are there to enable situational awareness. And frankly, I think your sector needs to educate both the government and the public on what is there and how they could use it. We need to team. And ICT can will enable that. I guess the question I pose to you, do you as a sector work as a team? Or you don't have enough headspace because you're largely SMEs trying to actually get your business running. Thirdly, to be prepared, we need your sector and your expertise to input to a national resilience strategy and plan. We need to think about the international partnerships in the ICT sector, in the first case with New Zealand and how that could work. And we have been interacting with the Australian and New Zealand Leadership Forum, which is the business communities from both countries, and they're interested in addressing these issues with us. But the other thing that I think we need from you is imagination. You did have that. Dr. Pearcey had that in some of his early statements. But what could we do at a system level? And what I'd say here is that whilst it is necessary to sell your products, take your understanding of the potential of the technology and start talking about what we could do at a system level. I, you know, I get awfully excited when you know, the latest one of these comes out, the phone or whatever. But let's talk about how ICT can enable at a system level and help us. So let's reflect on what Dr. Pearcey said back in 1948. And that's on your website. We talked about it's not inconceivable that a, an automatic encyclopedic service operated through a national teleprinter or telephone system will one day exist. And he said, people today call that the World Wide Web. I'm going to be a bit presumptuous. And if Dr. Pearcey was here today, might what, he, what might he say, given the systemic challenges we're facing and the, the, the challenges that we're going to face as a society in forthcoming decades? Well, I took a punt at it. It's not inconceivable that an intelligent information system that shares verified information and an integrated picture of how our society is functioning identifies emergent risks and most importantly allows us to experience the consequences of failing to act. It's almost like immersive simulation or immersive gaming. It then presents us with intelligent and achievable options to better prepare for the challenges ahead will one day exist. If it does, people of the future might call this result sentience. The capacity to feel, perceive and experience subjectively. And that's why I say that sentience is required because reason and logic is not enough. Preparedness in a military sense allows you to feel, perceive and experience subjectively a whole range of challenges in a crisis environment before you actually have to go and do it. That's why you have a change in attitude. That's why you have a change in culture. In our society, we are paddling as fast as we can in reaction to COVID because we didn't do that. With that, I'll hand back over for the discussion. Thank you. Thanks very much, John. Uh, I'd just like to remind everybody who's uh, who's with us today that uh, John and I are gonna have a, a short chat now, uh, but I would encourage all of you to put your questions for John in the Q&A function. So just go ahead to the, the bottom of your Zoom profile and, and click the Q&A button, put your questions in there, and we look forward to receiving those and discussing them. So John, that was a, 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 a lot to think about in what you've got to say. Uh, hopefully many people see that at the high level, it's, it's self-evident, but of course the challenge is getting down to the detail. So we have, quite a few examples, particularly in the technology space, of companies in Australia that have dominated their market niche globally. 
our award recipient today, Grant Petty with Blackmagic Design is an excellent example. And there are others in online travel services, mining technology, advanced medical device manufacturing, and bleeding edge high performance additive manufacturing across the realm of different technologies. So I wonder if I can tempt you, do you see an obvious first choice amongst the capabilities for national focus in the digital and computing technologies that can underpin the sentient smart sovereignty across the jigsaw that you're looking at? I'll, I'll give you one example. So about the last four or five months, uh, I brought a team together to help an AI startup here in Australia. Um, I was asked to do that by the Centre for Defence Industry Corporation. And I've played with the SMEs a bit in the last few years. Now, here I see an, a, a very interesting capability, a lot of innovation happening. But from the perspective of an SME, it's like trying to climb Mount Everest with a huge backpack on there. So they're struggling to get into the system. So the first thing I did is have a look at what is our national policy or concept or goals for AI. And then I went and had a look at the defense ones as well. We are missing some fundamental pieces at that sort of level that allow an SME or an innovator to make rapid progress or connection and to be supported. I mean, getting into defenses as an SME is, is a nightmare with the processes and contracting the acquisition system. So in essence, when you look at key capabilities, you can't get situational awareness of a complex system without AI and ML. It's not going to happen. But the policy goals that are in existence don't even cover these areas. They're talking about health and you know, welfare areas and things like that, which are valuable. But we've got to decide which areas we need to have that sovereign capability in and then how we support the SMEs, connect them together, mentor them and give them priority. Now, in this AI sector, these people are also being told, well, if you want to play into the big projects, you've got to go and subcontract to a big prime. And the big primes you have to subcontract to are foreign owned. So we need to be able to use government buying power to start deciding what parts of our industry base need to be prioritized. We do it to a degree in defense for the big hardware areas or some of the components. We've got Australian industry participation requirements. We need to do it beyond that. And the government's got the buying power that it can say, right, X percentage needs to be put into Australian industry. We'll evaluate what's there and we'll support it to do it. And there needs to be funds in there. I don't think this is the world's hugest amount of funds to do it, but it's a change in approach where we have to support that Australian innovation because trying to compete with the mass of this capability and the advantage or the, the lead, for example, that the US or China has in AI is incredibly difficult. If we don't do this, then we're going to end up being dumb, dumb consumers in my view. Okay, so that, that leads us to another, another sort of challenging question. Taking the, the holistic systems approach that you've recommended, uh, and again, which seems the rational way to try and deal with this problem or this, this opportunity, really. Uh, but it comes with a persistently thorny challenge. That is, the deeper and more significant challenge than just project management. We need to have a, a trusted, honest broker, a, the glue, to keep the system together and operating while the various participants in government and industry and society work on their elements to create the architecture and the, and the solutions. Do you have a view on how we might have that glue? There was an interesting hint coming out of the first principles of review of defense back in about 2015. And they identified a real gap. So what happened is there's hundreds of projects in defense. So I'll use those as an example. And the first principles review said, no, you've got to have a program level design. So on top of that, they identified 40 programs. Uh, three years of my reserve work in recent years was done looking at that program design layer. When I finally resigned from the reserves in frustration last year, there was still no program level design. Now, there are bureaucratic or process reasons for that. But the, the principle of the first principles review, to have that layer of program level design, I think was a really good idea. It was valid. So what we can do is A, see what was proposed and why it didn't work, and then ask how you would apply that outside to the total industry base in Australia. The reason I'm also saying that is the conclusion that Ian McDonnell and I came to with the work we were doing was that the pace of development, the, the, the ability, the, the acquisition cycle time, the innovation cycle time in defense at the tactical level is brilliant, 
but at the whole system or project level is far too slow. Defense cannot move at the speed of technology. So let's take some of the thinking and principles there in this area. And we have to, in fact, look at this program level design as a partnership with industry, as well as the SMEs from both sides and government. Um, what we proposed as one of the outcomes of the work we're doing was for a National Resilience Institute, independent of government, but partnered with government and industry in other areas, apolitical, that can start to do initially that situation awareness, the risk analysis, where you're not bound by political limitations of what you can do, and then tries to act as a broker. Um, and again, this is actually a not-for-profit, so it's not a profit-making venture, because there's some fantastic stuff you read in the industry groups and in the separate industry sectors. It's just not glued together. We're also saying that if you look at this national resilience level that they should pick up, it can't be stuck in a single government department. You really need this to be a function straight to the PMO's office. That's a challenge. Um, and we realise there's a political roadblock, but we shouldn't stop us aspiring to do that because the challenges we will face going in the next decade are going to make our response to COVID look uh, a simpler problem to deal with. Great. Thanks. And there's... There's some questions coming in that relate to this, but first off, uh, I'd like to invite Grant, uh, Grant Petty, our award winner. He's got a question he'd like to ask you. So if we can bring Grant online. <laughs> Sorry, we had to push a whole bunch of buttons that came up because software is so good at protecting us from ever doing anything wrong anymore. I reckon we're living in a software hell, by the way. Um, <laughs> there's just such a disconnect between the people writing the code and people using it now. But um, I really liked your presentation. Thank you very much for going through that, but I was a little bit worried about your conclusion at the end. My question is related to, as a pilot, the thing that worries me deeply, the reason I write all the software that runs my company and does all the scheduling and marketing and everything, the whole company is essentially run, I personally write the code, which meant that in February, I could just change all that code to adapt in real time for what we're doing. The problem that I see is that every piece of code that's written in anything to do with business, I mean, there's a whole bunch of other issues to do with why there's no innovation and the kinds of people that actually run businesses in Australia because of the compliance workload. And every time business complains about anything, it's always like, oh, payroll tax. It's like, who cares about payroll tax? There's other problems that are, affect the kind of people that essentially have power in this country. But, but just to get back to this technology problem, if the, the problem that you have is that every piece of code that's written, say, for example, if you're flying a, an F-35 fighter jet and you are got a whole bunch of information presented to you because all the code that's been written is to do that, but that information has been pre-shaped by what someone thought would happen before you went to war. And you don't know whether the guy that you're protecting on the ground is hungry or whether his gun's got ammunition. I mean, you have a very limited scope because that's what someone thought you needed to know. So what you have is a situation where you are, all the code is written to present people with information. And that creates a really rigid structure that means that essentially what you're doing is adding more people I mean, I see any group of people as essentially an artificial intelligence. I mean, that has all the core marks of that. That's why we can talk. What we're actually doing here, there's what, 63 people online? We're essentially, you know, we're a little in artificial intelligence right now, thinking and talking. The problem is, any, that I can see is any centralization, like in other words, the software, my, my software makes its own decisions. If anything, we need to have information coming out of the system to show us what it's actually doing, because we don't know what it's doing, because it's making a lot of complex decisions about what parts to buy and what to schedule and stuff like that, but that's the problem. Any kind of way to fix the system and try and unify a system or unify people actually in eventually creates a complexity and a centralization <coughs> that destroys a free market of ideas. So in other words, one of the great reasons that democracy works is because you decentralize and you allow a free market for ideas. Whereas in an authoritarian government, you can't get a new idea up. In fact, the whole system is designed to re reject new ideas because it makes people look bad. And the people that know the rules, the people that that uh, comply with those rules, the people that make everyone around them look good, are the people who do well in communism, whereas in a, in a democracy, you can't stop a good idea. And the reason black magic exists, and we were almost killed multiple times, and we had multiple attacks, every two years roughly we get some psychopath, because they couldn't stop a good idea. All we had to do is not use anyone else's money, so we had to fund it ourselves. So the problem is that anything you try and do that involves any kind of centralization, which is what you need to do to try and unify stuff, actually will eventually create the very thing that you're trying to fight against because you can't be prepared. Because if you're a business, any level of preparedness for something that doesn't exist yet is waste. 
what you actually need is rapid mobility and rapid change. But if you look at the way the computer systems are written, they're written by consulting companies. Like I was sort of, you know, we've, so it took two weeks to get a film scanner out of the country, but you've got all these planes sitting around. Well, I was saying to someone, I bet the reason why they haven't turned all those aircraft across to the to freight is because the code that runs in their computers probably doesn't allow them to do that. Yeah. So they've actually got a limitation. They've got to go and outsource the people that they've outsourced to. They've got to change the code, make it a project, all that kind of stuff. And then eventually, oh, now we can run out and expand our freight business or whatever, because it's all been so driven by software. But that software is developed to give me information because I'm in control, but that's a bottleneck. And the more of those kinds of people you have, like we've got homeless people in the street in the city, but we're putting more money into tax. Well, World War One's taxes, but those taxes aren't going to the homeless people. They're going to guys with spreadsheets in office buildings working out how to solve the homeless problem. So I'm kind of wondering, the conclusion to me seems like it's just going to destroy itself because the centralization process is actually the problem itself. But how do you coordinate? But you know, like how do you get all these pieces? Like maybe that's what artificial intelligence will actually fix our democracy because we can be free agents, but unified somehow. I don't know, but yeah. I'm sort of curious. So sorry, the, it's a long question. That's right. The reason I agreed to get a team together and help this AI startup is I saw something there that really impressed me. It comes out and justifies and explains the recommendation it's made. And that's the thing that worries me about AI. So the reason I get worried about technology is when we went from the Mirage to the, uh, to the uh, F-18, there was a lot more technology in it. And we found that people who flew that for the first time without flying another you know, complex airplane accepted the information they saw on the screen. Whereas when you were brought up, you know, running around 900 kilometers an hour, the whole time in your brain, you're doing some really basic math. I know I'm moving out at eight miles a minute and I know I should be, and you've got a really basic computation. Does what I'm seeing make sense? So that was instilled. And now we see, you know, people with GPS driving through hedges into ponds in the UK. I've seen flying <laughs> light aircraft, people run around and they will follow the GPS, even though we've seen significant errors can occur at various times. So what they're not yeah. doing is looking outside the cockpit and going, Hey, does this make sense? So there is an issue of how you train people. The information is there to support you. AI, I think, could be a huge risk to us if we do it unintelligently, particularly given some of the countries who've got the advantage. So when you come back into this problem, the reason we're arguing that you have to do risk assessment outside of government independently is because if you do it inside of bureaucracy, you are not allowed to raise certain issues. When I was doing futures work years ago, we raised one of the scenarios we were raising was a basically a disintegration of our federation in our own futures work. We were then told to classify the study secret osteo because no one in the government could even question the, you know, the, the continuity of the federation. Well, here we are in 2020 and we're starting to see that. So mm. you need to do it independently, but we're not saying there's a single institute doing this. Mindaru is setting something up to do something similar, you know, funded by Twiggy. We're dealing with people in the UK and multiple institutes. So what we're trying to do is create almost like a, a network, a mesh of ecosystem looking at these things, but outside of bureaucracies. I'm a believer that we have to have a greater degree of participative democracy, but you can only do that if you have an informed public and you can only do it if you treat the public as being intelligent rather than just delivering, you know, this mindless marketing and then keep telling people what's eight months ago. How good is that? <laughs> well, it's not that good anymore. So what we're talking about is a distributed system without a hierarchy. When you look at where the, certainly where Air Force has gone, we realized in the late nineties, we had really a couple of fundamental problems. One was this dependence on hierarchy for all decisions. You cannot operate that way in a war, it, right at the coalface. You've got to delegate authority. The other one was tribalism. You know, we had the fighter pilots fighting the, you know, the transport fighting, fighting these other groups and we were all up ourselves. So we made a fundamental shift, cultural shift first. So what I'm talking about here is the bureaucracy and the way of government is not fit for purpose for the complex world we live in. So what we're trying to do in the first phase of being a part of a network of people doing independent uh, assessment uh, for situation awareness is to raise the level of awareness of society. This is not good enough. We're intelligent enough as a society to rethink of other models of doing it. Participative democracy can have its traps. I mean, visiting Switzerland last year, I found out they didn't give women the vote till the 1970s because their form of participative democracy allowed all these blokes in the cantons to decide they keep the women out of it. There's a bit of a trap with participative in some ways, but this is not about putting this into a department or government's control. It's about having a different discussion publicly. 
Now we need to enable that innovation that's happening at the industry level. But I think the role of government is not to directly control or micromanage it, is to set the market conditions, the enablers and support that allow those various initiatives to perhaps think about, you know, you're trying to herd sheep through a gateway at the end of a paddock. The gateway is the characteristic or attribute that's important for your society to be, how can we help everybody have those characteristics and attributes that are gonna make us more resilient? I've explained that approach to, to a number of senator friends of mine. The current political system doesn't allow that to happen, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't try to do it. But I agree, this is not hierarchical, it's not centralized control, and the moment a bureaucracy gets their hands on it, it's done. Mm. Thanks. Great, so thanks, John. And, and actually that leads us well into a question that's being posed by Ken Mann. He's talking about the changes that you've just been describing and he highlights, as we all know, that one of the biggest challenges in anything is actually to move the people and therefore the, the culture of, of change. So do you think that the pandemic has given us a, an opportunity that a perspective is created now that will actually allow us to move the culture and sustain this kind of change? Or is that just a, an op optimistic view of a very short term impact? I think it opens the door for a different conversation. So when we started this particular institute, I chair now, we were trying to look at the systemic interactions between energy, economy and the environment as complex systems. So what we decided to do was have conversations about each piece and write about it. And we were waiting for a crisis to then be able to do the bigger picture story. The crisis last year that we were talking about was conflict. We thought oh, that's probably going to be grey war, not things. The second one was economic. And we assumed that within the next decade, the fundamental weakness in our global economic system would manifest itself and there was an opportunity. The third one we were talking about in conferences last year was a pandemic. But we thought the economic one would, we could see what it was like, it would hit us first. But we were talking about the impacts of the pandemics on, on for example, global shipping and, and trade systems. Now we've had a crisis, the doors opened up. But I think one of the problems is, is that when I listen to some of the discussions politically, you know, if we can get this thing sort of contained and a vaccine comes, we're fine and beautiful. No, because where we're going with the global economy, we can't quarantine ourselves from the global economic problems. What we've done with, with coronavirus is lift the lid off a problem, and this has accentuated it. But the underlying systemic problems with our economy, with our environment, were there beforehand. And they're manifesting themselves more and more each year. So what will happen, I reckon, is that they're going to have change fatigue and a lot of yelling at each other. The door is open to have a different conversation. When the reality of the economic pain starts to hit us next year and the year after, we're going to have a couple of problems. Because of the mental pressures, some people might start to shut down. It's all too hard. But on the other hand, we might be able to say to people, there is a way out of it. What a, lot, a number of our politicians are concerned about now is people losing hope. So what we need to do is have the story or the narrative that there is hope. If we're aware, we work as a team and we're prepared to prepare for things, then there is a way of doing with this. And, and that is a story of hope. We don't need the government to tell that if we can get thousands of Australians having this conversation. So I'm strangely optimistic that this gives us an opportunity to change the conversation. Okay, so again, continuing in that theme of, of sort of changing the conversation and, and ways that we might need to change behaviours. Um, Wayne Fitzsimmons is asking about procurement policies. He, he feels that the, the, the state typically puts the prudential interests uh, as paramount. And in so doing, the, the small and medium enterprises, the companies that are typically the most agile and the most likely to make the, the radical contributions to the changes that you've been talking about, are often eliminated before a project even comes out for participation. So is it likely that one of the perhaps easier changes rather than whole cultural change is just to get a better model of, of government procurement? But the way I think we need to address that is have a conversation in public. So when this whole thing broke out with the pandemic and we realized that we could only make you know, 12 million masks a year or something, so there was a lot of encouragement, industry, come on, see what you can do. So I've talked to two different companies that put a lot of their own money in, got the equipment, started making masks and PPE. Now, as the supply chains, particularly from China, started to come back on, 
they noticed something really interesting. They were applauded for the first few months and then government agencies and hospitals and others started buying the cheapest product again because there's budget problems. Well, <clears throat> that's madness. We knew we had a problem. Anyone who thinks this is a once a lifetime event is living on a different planet. I mean, history is not linear now, it's actually going exponential. What we need and what we should as Australian demand our government does is that when we've seen these companies react as well as they did and invest their money and take a risk, then the government's expenditure on health or medicines are the largest medicine purchaser in, in, in Australia. We should specify in there that a proportion of government funded expenditure in health or this will go to Australian companies where they have the capacity and we will build a capacity in the sector. That will happen if the Australian voters stop being quiet Australians and say, hang on, these industries have done a great job. Thank you so much for doing this. But health minister, industry minister, how about you do something about supporting those industries in turn? It's going to have to be pressure from the voters when they understand. So what we're trying to do with the project is collect all these little stories in each of our workshops. And then we will try and put those stories out there so the voters can go and talk to their local rep and go, what are you doing about it? I've seen that work with fuel security work I've done. We need to do the same thing here. Okay. Well, I hope that uh, that helps people see that there are ways to get around what have been perennial problems. So I'd like to, to take that one more question before we run out of time. Um, Philip McRae has come through and he's talking about something that we all know well, which, which you mentioned in your, in your oration, that as a country, historically, we've done really well with, with mining and agriculture, with our primary industries, and our governments have typically built their perspective of the world on the back of those industries. And for a while, we were doing really well with manufacturing, but then the government decided it just wasn't worth the effort anymore. And of course, now we have lost the automotive manufacturing industry, which in and of itself may not be the biggest loss, but all the manufacturing industry capabilities that were based on having that platform are now, of course, under threat, or in fact, have already left. We're replacing, as I said earlier, some of that with new advanced manufacturing capabilities. But what Philip's asking about is, can we broaden our view? Can we see a way to get the discussion to see strategic industry sectors that are not mining and agriculture and financial services? Can we stop being a pure services industry? And as you said, there's the risk that even with our IP, we're, we're rushing to get our IP out of our research base and just flush it out into the rest of the world rather than build inherent capabilities. I think there is. I'll, I'll give you the example of fuel security that I've been working on since 2011. <clears throat> Back in about 2013, I went to speak to the, what was the Department of Resources, Energy and Tourism. Now, what a logical combination that one was. And I said to them, we've just gone from seven to four refineries. If we lose all our oil refining industry in this country, not only are we 100% import dependent on refined fuels from Asia, um, but all those industries that hang off a refinery from plastics to pharmaceuticals, everything else, well, that's gone as well. And I'll, I'll never forget this. I was told, no, 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 you've got to understand we're, we're becoming a services economy and we don't need to have any refineries at all because it's cheaper to import refined fuel. Now, I've told that story to two governments, uh, Joint Parliamentary Committee inquiries. We've been telling it in public because you listen and they go, are you serious? You're serious that it's cheaper to import refined fuel. We don't need anything here. I think the classic was at the start of last year when a Department of Energy spokesman said, we're not worried about our low fuel stocks because we haven't had a problem for 30 years. How do you reckon they feel now? And I, so what we need to do is not try and argue at a policy level with the politician direct, is to go to the Australian public take these issues and try and distill them into examples because common sense very soon tells you that you don't leave the future of our country to economists. And I apologize to the economists out there, but you can't leave it just to the economist view. There has to be a balance. So I think that by taking these areas, distilling it into a story that the everyday Australian can understand and say, do you think it makes sense? Because the only way I believe we've got the whole fuel security issue going was the constituents of Andrew Hastie in West Australia 
read all the stuff that myself and a group of others were writing on the madness of our fuel security. They spoke to Andrew Hasty. He rang me up. We had breakfast. And I said, this is how dumb it is. Andrew then took that on as the chair of the Joint Parliamentary Committee on Intelligence and Security. And in 2018, his committee put a task on government to do a liquid fuel security review. That was the first time we really started to get something moving. The fact it's been now 18 months late and sitting on the energy minister's desk since last Christmas because of the COVID crisis is a challenge, but we we're able to get issues out there and addressed, albeit things happen slowly in government. We need to do that for a lot of areas and tell our politicians that what you're doing is not good enough. We've got this massive risk coming towards us. Right now, we've got a government beating up the, the Victorian government for not having a plan. I'm not going to tell you, there is no plan of how we're going to deal with all these other major crises coming at us. So it's up to us as Australians not to accept that, to say, oi, we want you to address this and explain to us why you're not doing it. We can, we vote. It's up to us to stop being complacent. So I think there's a way of doing it. We've just got to get more active as a population and, you know, not just shoot to Bali or down to the beach every weekend and watch the footy. Take a little bit of a time to think about the country that we're building and what happens to the next couple of generations. Thank you, John. That's been just a, an excellent talk and, and you finished on exactly the, the topic that the Pusey Foundation is all about. We want to be engaged and focused on what the future can be if we all put our hands to the wheel and make things happen. So thank you very much for sharing your time with us today and your expertise. And we look forward to continuing to find ways to collaborate with you on what is clearly an important mission for every Australian. Thank you, Jordan. Thank you to the, to the Foundation. Now, I'd like to hand back to our illustrious chairman, Mr. Wayne Fitzsimmons, to formally close this afternoon's proceedings. Wayne, over to you. Thanks, Jordan. Um, thanks, John. Uh, thanks to Jordan, your team and colleagues here in Victoria for a great program this evening. John has certainly lived up to the extraordinary high expectations we have developed for the PSC oration. It was a great and stimulating presentation to close out a very full program on the ninth day of Victoria's 2020 Digital Innovation Festival. Following a wonderful round table at lunchtime today on Australia as a technology led economy after the 2020 pandemic, enabling a resilient future, to hear John's truly engaging and thought provoking presentation on the closely related topic of how do we address our resilience and preparedness in this age of mistrust? It's quite uplifting, personally challenging. And the introduction of the word sentience, sentience, sentience <laughs> the capacity to feel, perceive or experience subjectively is something I've never really thought about. And I thank you for bringing that to our attention. And I can assure you the PC Foundation we'll address your challenge that you've raised, John, about we have to raise these issues and bring to the attention of our elected officials that these are serious issues and we are up to doing something about it as a nation. So um, I'm sure we greatly appreciate the substantial effort all participants have put in when preparing for these Zoom sessions. Who would have thought we would all be doing this on the web in 2020? Thank you to all. And a big thanks to our Victorian Chair, Jordan, and Deputy Chair, Elaine, for the impressive facilitation of this afternoon's proceedings. May I extend my congratulations once again to the Victorian Entrepreneur of the Year in 2020, Grant Petty. So well-deserved, Grant. I wish you all the very best for the national awards in November. You have indeed set a high bar, and thank you for your participation today. I'm not supposed to identify individuals, but I will. Thanks to the Victorian government team led by Kathy Coulters and Kelly Hutchinson for staging the Digital Innovation Festival. As I said earlier, this is our fifth year of involvement and we just love being part of it and making a contribution to the economy and the development of Victoria's capability. This afternoon's oration concludes the third of our five events that have been part of the 2020 DIF along with the delightful Cards for the Future, which has been and will continue to take place uh, each morning of the festival at 9.30 a.m., where humanity shapes technology. And then, of course, the High School Student Hackathon, in partnership with ScienceWorks and Museums Victoria,
kicking off this Friday. I'm looking forward to seeing what those clever teams of students come up with as they consider how digital innovations might support Victorians adapt to change and maybe even force our politicians to rethink their strategy. Before I go, I'd like to draw your attention to a few other great initiatives the PSC Foundation has on the go currently. We have commissioned Graham Phillipson to write the definitive history of Australia's great ICT industry. It's progressing very well, well and we're looking for financial support, by the way. It's a, it's a project, it, it, it's developing a book, and it's also we're looking at a virtual museum initiative, and we're linking up with all sorts of institutions that have approached us with this initiative. Queensland's holding its Entrepreneur Award, the equivalent of what we did this afternoon, on Tuesday the 6th of October. I hope, normally hope to be there, but I don't rate my chances very highly as of today. Um, Queensland is for Queenslanders, I'm told. But it will be real, and maybe I'll be able to appear in, in a virtual sense. Celebrating women's contribution to Australia's computing industries. We'll be holding a wonderful event on Ada Lovelace Day on Tuesday, the 13th of October 2020. It'll be an all female event. Um, and it's part of our 2020 New South Wales State Awards. We've got awards coming up for, New, uh, for Tasmania and South Australia. And then in November on the 19th, we'll have our national event, the PSC Medal, Hall of Fame, and National Entrepreneur Awards um, in Sydney. And an ongoing series of conversations that we hold on the last Wednesday of each month. And John was a participant in one of these a couple of months back. Details of all these events are on our website, the same one that you registered for this event. And so much more, if you wish to write to us, Please do so as we're very keen to improve our presentations and ensure that what we're talking about is relevant to you and to our community. This is the close of our official proceedings for this evening. My sincere thanks to all of you for your attendance and the support for our PSC Foundation. Please enjoy the rest of your evening and I hope we get to meet again soon. Thank you and good night. <laughs>